because I don't give a shit. I'd have gone to bed and I would have never woke up. And that was 2004. And she dialed 911 and got me to the hospital. Wow. Well, thank God. And she thank did God. it this last time, too. Yeah? I started up the stairs and I couldn't make it up the stairs. <clears throat> Took me to the hospital. No surgeon wanted to do the surgery. And they found this little Vietnamese girl. And she said she would do it. And she went in there. And when she got in there, there was so much scar tissue and damage from my heart that they thought I would live eight days. Wow. So on the fifth day, I went into cardiac arrest twice. And they had to resuscitate me. I was gone like nine minutes the first time after the surgery. I was... I came out of the surgery, Scott, and I had no blood pressure when I got to the emergency room. And if Catherine and my brother and sister had not been there, they would have called it. Mm -hmm. Okay, then I made it five days. I made it five days and went into cardiac arrest. Nine minutes, resuscitated, stayed about four minutes, went back out for another 10 minutes. But that was about the process of deciding whether to stay or go, knowing the damage I'm going to deal with. What inspired you to stay? You. <laughs> I wouldn't miss this. Anybody who knows me knows that for 42 years, I said that the battle for the souls of humankind would be fought in health care. And based on that, I wrote it, Peace in the Light, in 1995, which was my attack plan. And if you take that book at Peace from 1995 and you walk in my life today, you don't have a chance. Hmm. I'm on their ass. I co-wrote the NAST, I co-wrote the Veterans Administration's uh, NoVet Dialogue, their palliative end-of-life care program. I'm a co-writer. And I'm right now writing the COVID-19 uh, reaction alert for veterans in CLCs, which is continuous living centers, and for at-home health care. Mm -hmm. I created a program for the VA called If You Love Them, Keep Them Home As Long As You Can, and they're implementing it in the COVID-19 program. Why I pulled away from what I call the Swami business, you know, why I kind of pulled away because I couldn't see the federal government seeing me reading minds. You know, I couldn't, I knew the two characters wouldn't play. Mm. So I just did my regular shows, you know, the things I usually do. And then I, I would probably turn down a hundred events or programs a year. Wow. All over the world. I mean, look at Save. Save's probably... Saved at Peace and Secrets probably sold over 22 million books worldwide. Hmm. So I had to make a choice. Either keep the government's eye on me as palliative and end-of-life care or be mind reading. Hmm. Healing the sick, raising the dead, all that stuff I used to do. All those murder mysteries I solved. You know, I think the FBI gives me credit for seven. You know, all those lost kids and murders and all that stuff. But that didn't benefit, uh, Scott, that didn't benefit what the goal was. So when the Battle for the Souls of Humankind got here, which is where we are now, mm. I can look back and be proud that I did what I did. Mm. But when you guys come together to do something, I don't care. I'm going to be a part and do whatever my job is to help because we've been friends way too long and having the same cult goals. Just mine was to drive myself into the middle of the veterans administration because I already know they're going to use the VA to structure single pay. Wow. The veteran administration is socialized medicine. Mm -hmm. Right. Everything that happens there is what they're going to use as protocol. That makes I knew sense. That Gates. I described Gates in in Saved by the Light in two thousand in nineteen ninety four. I described wow. Microsoft just got the Jedi contract to upgrade the Defense Department. 
They just beat out on last Thursday. So Gates controls the Defense Department and and health care. Wow. Wow. I've, I've watched him, Scott, I've watched him now for 39 years. I knew this 39 years ago. Wow. I wrote about it 25 years ago and outlined in chapter five in Saved by the Light exactly what was going to happen hmm. and exactly what I said has happened. So what do you see taking place next? How do you see it's going to unfold, Daniel? Easy. It'll die off now because it's a virus. It can't stand over 80 degrees. Mm -hmm. It's three nanometers, so it weighs a ton. At three nanometers, it weighs a ton. As it weighs a ton, it's got a seven-foot radius, spray radius, and at that kind of weight, it's on the ground. Mm -hmm. It'll disappear in the summer, and it'll come back in the fall with a rage unfathomable. So two things can happen. You can control the presidential election. They only needed Hillary for four years and they would have enslaved us. Everybody would have mandatory vaccines. This is what would happen. Well, now, because it dies in the summer at 80 degrees, I don't care. And uh, if you look at the Stanford report, you realize that about 75 to 80% of all Americans have already been infected. Wow. Stan wow. The Stanford report doing antibiotic studies to see and if you built up anti-agents to it. Okay, so you can tell that probably it has less than a 0.02% death rate. Everybody's had it. I had it six weeks ago, five weeks ago. It liked to kick my ass because I'm old and fucked up. But nonetheless, it took me four days and I beat it. It's bullshit, Scott. It's a trick to control you. And if you look at the patent that Gates put out March 220, 2020, it is a, a chip that's not really a chip. It's a nanoparticle gel that finds itself and builds itself into your circulatory system. 220, March the 20th, 220, and the patent is 060606 06, is the number in the patent. No fucking way. I swear to you. Oh my God, that's unbelievable. Wow. <laughs> let, me what, let me tell you what it does, Scott. Let me tell you what it does. It's a gel. So it's nanoparticles, one one billionth the size of a particle, and it finds itself, it finds itself in your bloodstream, and it's using this barium aluminium uh, nanoparticle, which is the same thing in, in, uh, chemtrails okay and they're going to use 5g so it's all about your finances they, they all this shit about you can't touch money because the virus transmits on the vi on the money that's the, what's all you're going to hear so the fall will come so they can't have they're trying to control the election they're just trying to control rallies this is the thing that people don't get scott whoever is elected under the president of this next term, who I'm not a big Trump fan, but equal to the other side, uh-uh. I already know the name of that dance. Fauci is the one who co-developed the Corona-19. Fauci. Wow. Easy to find if you know where to look. Yeah, yeah. 214, when they, 214, in 2014, when they outlawed, when they outlawed the coronavirus, every animal, animal in the world has coronavirus. Every animal in the world has it. There's like a really? million different coronaviruses, okay? And it's the transgression, the transportation from animal to human is the issue. Well, they were close in 2014, but they outlawed it because it was getting out of control. That was at Chapel Hill and where they develop all that shit, Fort Dix, North Carolina. So when they stopped at Fauci with Dr. Shia, the woman that they can't find now, they got $3.7 million from the NIH, and they got $2.7 million from Gates and Soros, and they took the project to Wuhan in China. These are facts. It's not cons I'm not a conspiracy theory person. 
Right, right. You know, I don't have all that bullshit about me. I don't. I always used to call what we did the Swami business. Yeah, right. I don't have all that about me. You know, I'm just a guy that got a got a job, and I turned out to be a pretty good person because I know better. Mm -hmm. Even because I'm a nice or wonderful person. It's well, you you had that panoramic life review after you got electrocuted, and you saw what it's all about, I've had, I've and you said, four "Oh, of those puppies." Four now, wow! I haven't talked. I talked to you. I knew you after two, so there's two since we really uh, spent quality time together. Well, brain surgery and open heart surgery. Wow. I've been through. I mean, I've survived. I but you know what, Scott? If you needed somebody to do what my job is, which is to keep them home minus palliative and end of life mm -hmm. and if you can die at home in a way that what i call the centers program this was my mission and my goal this is what i was supposed to do okay so this is what i did mm -hmm. i don't i had to be the person who understands how medicine works mm -hmm. okay i've been given six months or less to live 86 times. <laughs> so if you want to talk about pain, you want to talk about surgery, you want to talk about operations, and you want to talk about survival against impossible odds, they can't figure out how I'm alive now. Mm. My cardiologist sees me every two months because there is no way I could be alive. My blood pressure is 71 over 40. That ain't nothing. That's nothing. It's just a machine. The body's just a machine and I've been out of it so many times till it doesn't surprise me. I know what to do to it. Yeah. I could make it think I'm roughly 18 to 21% heart function. But I have wow. it thinking. I think I have it thinking it's at forty three percent. So as long as it doesn't know the difference, who cares? I love that. That's a beautiful. That's a beautiful way for us to remember. And how, how how do you program your body? Like any secrets that for for people that haven't had all those out of body experiences, how do they program their body? Depends on your condition and your blood type. What am I walking up to? Now, everybody's uniquely different. How they're, everybody thinks DNA is some kind of big deal. Okay? But it's RNA, it's ribonucleic acid. It's your RNA. Okay? So everybody's uniquely different, Scott, but key trace minerals. If you're not taking your trace minerals every day, you have screwed yourself. Really? Okay. You can go to, Trace Mineral Research on Amazon, and for $16, you can get a bottle of drops. I got it, the big blue bottle. You put 20 drops in apple juice, at either at 10, 2, or 4. Okay. The body hunts sugar at 10, 2, or 4. So since it's going to be hunting sugar, there's probably 80,000 other reactions or 80 million other reactions happening at the same time. And it delivers the trace minerals where it's needed. Okay, why I think trace mineral research is chelated and nanoparticulated, it means that the mitochondrial cell wall does not react to it with a charge. So you're putting the trace minerals, and trace minerals are this, Scott. Without trace minerals, no compound, enzyme, or solution reactions happens in the body. And if it does happen, it happens at the, based on the lack of your basic 66 trace minerals, it, la it reacts ineffectively or not to the total. So trace minerals are your key. B complex time release. Okay. The body strips out three, six and 12 instantly. That's why if you take vitamin B complex and you pee in 10 minutes, it's all yellow. Right. Because the body as at three, six and twelve naturally being stripped out, the body says, Okay, that's enough B. No matter the fact that you need six, I mean you need seven, eight, nine, ten, and eleven. You need these. 
okay? And you need B9 and B6 as much as you need. I mean, most a lot of people need more B6, but you need B7, 8, and 9 as much as you need 3, 6, and 12. So it's got to be time release. Okay. I'm writing this down because I'm going to place an Amazon order as soon as we uh, get off the line. I mean, these are things I've taken in the past, but you're reminding me. And the trace minerals, I used to have that big blue bottle, and um, it's time to get, get more. Well, what you do is you get them out because it's 20 drops a day in apple juice. I think uh, orange juice orange juice is too acidic because mm -hmm. everybody understands pH. Right. The more pH balance your body is based on the water that you drink or – you know, they yeah, got I, I have I've I've had an alkaline water filter for what fifteen years. I mean when they first started coming out. Trace minerals, which would be more effective. Yeah. You yeah. notice it in your breathing, you notice it in your strength, you notice it. Now I trick my heart by using nitrous oxide, which is weightlifters. Weightlifters use nitrous oxide, nitric oxide. That's their, their key to getting the heart pumping so you can pump more iron. Now, I, because my heart is where it is, then I know little tricks. I know little tricks about how to make my heart think it's doing better than it does because it's just a machine. Although, when you look at it from a spiritual point of view, it has another value. Mm -hmm. We're talking about conditioning, you conditioning yourself at the age that you know we are getting to we are the people we are the as kissinger said we are the worthless eaters mm -hmm. worthless eaters 65 and older you're a worthless eater you're no Jeez. longer in productivity to society but now they've moved retirement uh this the, the congress kept theirs at 65 and ours is now at 67. Mm -hmm. okay well, think about this. When they created Social Security, Scott, you could retire at 65 and you started paying in 1933. The average life expectancy of a man in America in 1933 was 58. So if you couldn't retire to 65 to get your Social Security and the average man lived to be 58, what, what are they telling you there? Mm -hmm. Right, right. You they didn't think we would live that long. They didn't think, they didn't know that we were going to have the incredible opportunity to live as long as we can, take Cialis or Viagra so we can fuck until we're 80. Mm -hmm. um, they, didn't, they didn't know that was what was going to happen. They didn't know about anti-aging medicine. And that we are, I, 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 me, me, me. We are narcissists. Every <laughs> baby boomer is a narcissist. Every single one. Hmm. And narcissism drives, look at plastic surgery, look at all the things that's happening. Right. Is driving the basic nature of all baby boomers born between 1940 and 1967. Mm -hmm. See, I'm still fun, Scott. Oh my God, you rock! You rock! I love connecting with you. I'll just Always tell have. the truth. Yeah. I mean, I'll just tell the truth. And when uh, I never could quite pin down <laughs> what we were doing, but whatever was my part. I will do it. What don't you think that, uh, so see, here's what I have always gotten, that we live in all these alternate realities. There's many different probable futures and alternate realities. And this lifetime is very much about choosing which earth we want to continue with, you know, because there's going to be a lot of, there probably already are a lot of different Earths, you know, the Mayans, why did they disappear? They went into a different dimension. They stayed on Earth, but they went on a different Earth. They didn't want to be part of the Earth that was going to get colonized by a bunch of greedy white people. Um, or they so left and went back to Venus. Something like that. They went somewhere, but, you know, it's not like they all died. They just shifted their reality. You know how that goes. So I think I've always felt when I've tuned in, when I've had my multidimensional experiences, that we're here to get really clear on, okay, how are we doing at loving ourselves? How are we doing at loving each other? And what reality are we going to attract to the next big cycle of our soul evolution? And there's no right or wrong. There's no good or bad. Everybody gets to get what they want. You know, people want to be in a post-apocalyptic wasteland with cockroaches the size of my dog. 
then they get to have that, you know. A lot of good protein, though. Right. <laughs> I signed up for Rainbows and Unicorns with Daniel Brinkley and Friends. That's what I signed up for. <laughs> okay. Well, here's how I look at it. That's the four panoramic life of views. You see your life pass before you in a 360-degree panorama. You watch it from a second-person point of view as though you were your own best friend. Then you literally become every person that you ever encounter, and you feel the direct results of your interaction between you and them. You become them. Okay, so number one, nobody gets away with anything. Number two, the universe is fair and just. Number three, at the end of this review, if you're not coming back, because they always, they don't, I never hear the deal till the end of whether I want to come back or not. And the third near death experience, I was in the recovery room for 41 hours. They couldn't wake me up. Okay, but I was wandering through what I call the blue gray place. But at, after four of these panoramic life reviews, and after 42 years as a hospice volunteer, with more than 34,000 hours at the bedside of 2,010 people and been dead four times myself, fuck you. What do you think you know? Okay? You might know as much as me, but you don't know more than me. Then you ask yourself a question. If God couldn't come today and God sent you, in the life you just reviewed, what difference did you and God make? So the question everybody asks themselves is this. Make a list of everything that you think God is. Righteous, love, caring, divine, protective, all-knowing, all that. And as you write that list down, write how many times a day you get a chance to be that in the world that you live in. Mm. The meaning of this life is practicing being a God, which constitutes the three the three provovial thought patterns you just said, loving yourself. Because without loving yourself, how are you going to practice being a God? And how can you define bullshit from reality using the term love? So I use three of the Greek words, uh, phile, which is friendship, eros, which is getting some, and agape is being divine. So when I, if I love you, it's in one of those three places, which makes it a comfortable word for me to use, write, and put in everything I say. Because the worst thing about me, Scott, is I believe what I'm saying. And I have the firepower and the medical records to back it up. Yes, you do. Yes, you mm -hmm. do. And I've, I've watched you in action. I've watched you transform people's lives. I've watched you work with men that are dying and terrified to die and you hold them you show them you take them up to where you take them to and they come back crying with oh my god i'm not afraid to die anymore that's one of the most powerful things i've ever seen and i know you've done that 2010 of those puppies 2010 of those puppies yeah yeah 346 taking their last breath and i really love you know what the practice you're giving us, you know, the practice of write down your definition of God or whatever the archetype might be, Jesus or the Buddha or whatever no, it may be. I don't care. Don't whatever matter. Whatever you call it. And then how often are you practicing that? How often are you how creating often, opportunities many, in life to do that? Me. How many times a day do you get the opportunity to be one of those? which is all day, every day. So the conclusion you have to come to based on what I just said is the reason for this life is to practice it being a God, okay? And that there is no death. That's why I put chapter five in Saved by the Light, okay? There is no such thing as death. It's an illusion and a delusion, okay? So if the purpose of practicing being a God is here, right? Then there's where you focus. Then you start to look at the rules of practicing being a God. We come here helpless. We come here alone. We are forced in dynamics to create relationships because we come here helpless and we come here alone. 
Mm-hmm. So we need each other, which forms relationships. And in the course of the relationships and the sub-psychological concept, you think you're physical, dimensional, and separate from the person next to you, which is the biggest bunch of bullshit that's ever been thought of. I don't care how crazy you are or what world you live in. If you look at quantum theoretical dynamics from chaos all the way to the multi-universe theory, it is impossible in the, in the neutrino level of sub, 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 psychological energy, which is a neutrino. It's eight times subatomic in neutrinos. Okay, right there, it's still the same. It's still the same. Your ass is just connected to me as mine is to you as I am. And how do we connect? We connect in something called an atmosphere. Mm. What's so interesting about that is just air. Well, the atmosphere is 80% nitrogen and it is an electrical charge. It has an atmosphere, a stratosphere, and an ionosphere. So it's the electrical charge that you're living in that you call air that creates connectivity. And we breathe each other in and out through our breath and those eight sinus cavities that equally match the chakra fields. Mm. Super funny, Scott. I know how to breathe. I did an interview with Deepak Chopra, and he said that his estimate is that if you live an average life of about 85, 90 years, we will, sh- we will share approximately 10,000 molecules with every other person who ever lived. You will have had 10,000 of Hitler's molecules, 10,000 of the Buddha's molecules. I think I had about 100,000 of him before I got struck by lightning. I might think I was Hitler. <laughs> Yeah. Bad motherfucker, Scott. Mm. Yeah. You know, I don't have any problems about me. I know me, I understand me, and I'm a prick. But, mm. and I don't have a problem about it. Mm. But I do right. And I believe that there's a life after death, and I believe that we're great, powerful, and mighty spiritual beings with dignity, direction, and purpose. And I believe based on that, there's only one thing that can never go wrong in your life is you allow something to affect your dignity and excuse your direction and your purpose. Because by the time you earn the right to come to this dimension, this third level or fourth level dimensional reality, to practice the of God, you have earned the right to be great, powerful, and mighty. Everybody's a spiritual being with dignity, direction, and purpose in the story. But to be great, powerful, and mighty And I look up the definitions of those words before I call somebody that, and I know exactly what I'm calling them. It's just my way, Scott. Everybody thinks they know the definitions of words. Well, they don't. So if I write in a book about it, I put the definition, like prayer. What is prayer? Willful, conscious, intent. Mm -hmm. Look up willful, you look up conscious, you look intent, you know how to pray. Mm -hmm. (laughs) You know? Does prayer work? Non-local, trans, non-local dimensional reality to me. Yeah, it works. Absolutely. No, I have no problems about it. Do you think prayer works? Absolutely. How do you know? I've been where it works from. <laughs> Aliens. Without why is this? The other day, I was talking to, uh, to David Wilcon. Mm-hmm. And David was asking all kinds of questions. I said, David, listen to me. I said, I'm, I'm the king of death and the master of living. I'm joining the dead guy. Okay? I stay in my lane. I don't get into UFOs and all that kind of stuff. I said, if somebody asks me about it, I'll have an opinion. I said, I don't get into that. I don't, I'm, not all, I'm not Daniel for all season. I deal with palliative and end-of-life care and the fact that nobody died, and I stand on them. And you can't touch me. And I sold 22 million books, you know, and I made probably in my life, I probably made $14 million, Wow. you know, and I built the Twilight Brigade, the largest end of life care volunteer program for dying veterans in American history. And now I'm creating the United Intentions television network and I'm creating the transition brigade 
to for home health care. I'm moving out of the CLCs. I'm closing the Twilight Brigade, and it will become the Transition Brigade in home health care under the VA. And I'll make another $30 million. Wow. And I'll give that away. <laughs> Dan, I, I love hearing that. And, you know, certainly always let me know, you know, what you are doing. I'd love to hear about both his projects and we'll help promote them, especially because we're beginning to attract, you know, a good audience of our tribe. You know, our tribe is tuning in to us. And I would love to, you know, ha have periodic updates from you. Um, and then Thank tell you me what, what you need, how people can support this, what, what you're needing. Well, I need them not to know too much, okay? But mine is thoughts. I mean, when you rally to bring, when Transition Brigade comes online, it'll be like the Twilight Brigade. You know, you've got to come to learn how to follow and know certain things so that you can help the person who is the primary caregiver in the home. Mm -hmm. okay. I'm very, very linear and very, very practical, Scott. You know that about me. I mean, yeah. I don't you know me. You know, I don't. All right, so let me finish with, with David. So I said, Dave, let me tell you a little story. I said, in 1982, I had the entertainment procession at the World's Fair in Knoxville, Tennessee. And so there were 80 countries represented, and I got to know the, the ambassador to every country there was. Wow. And then I picked out the countries because I had the limousine service. I had the bands there, Bob Hope and um, the Ramones, because the girl that little girl that worked for us, she liked the Ramones as some punk band. And then we had uh, we had Rod Stewart, and we had a couple of the Faces, you know, the whole deal. Well, I got to be good friends because I love Peru, and I've what done thirty one tours to Peru, me and me and a bass. Okay. Right. 31 tours to, to Peru. And I'm on VITA, Volunteers for In America Development Assistance, with the uh, president of the Peruvian Interbank. So every year I go down to the ball in, in Lima and I go to the dinner with the president and the ambassador and with Ida and the Villa VITA, Volunteers for In America Development Assistance. So in 1983, there was Dr. Jimenez Borta. He was the Supreme Director of Antiquities for Peru. Okay, so I got to be friends with him in Knoxville. And I know Southern life, so I could take him places and let him see what Americans really were like. And we got to be good friends. So I'm in Peru, 1983. The World's Fair is over. I've been five or six times. I'd met Haiti, so... The, the richest bank in all of Peru, in all of South America, is Interbank. And Haiti's husband founded Interbank. Okay. So I met her. So we were in his office in Lima. And this little assistant comes in, little guy comes in. And I think it was Jimenez's boyfriend, you know, his little boy toy because they could watch the interaction. I'm not going to say that like I could say it to you, Scott, you know, because I always thought he was hitting on me, but I wasn't thinking about it. <laughs> right. I got what I wanted. I didn't give a shit. So the little guy comes in. We get in a, a car, a little black, looked like a, I, I think it was a Cita, but a Cita would be a Fiat, you know. In, I know, I know Fiat's. Yeah, my very first car was a Fiat 850 Spider. I swear, I had an 850 Spider. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, it was a convertible. It was red. It was my first car. I bought it when I was. I couldn't even drive yet. I bought it when I was 15 and a half because I had saved a bunch of money because I was. I knew how to make money back then, and uh, my very first car, a little Fiat 850 Spider. That would have been in 1973. 1973. Well, that's what this was a four door, but it was well, a my, seat. Okay. Yeah, this is a Cita, Fiat little thing. So we go to this military base. It was in downtown Lima. I could probably find it again. We go upstairs and we walk in this room. And there's this glass petition, like you see when they're interviewing people for uh, 
um, you know, behind the glass and saw the police are interrogating and you see this glass and they roll this, they roll this being. And he was a little guy. He was probably three, seven, maybe four feet, if that. Wow. He had pinkish colored, colored skin. He had a big little head. It, it was, I would think he was, by the time I saw him, he had a, that pigmentation must have been dying out based on blood flow. Okay. Cause you know, I've been, I know what dying's all about. I've been a hospice volunteer 42 years and I'd been a hospice volunteer then probably since 77. So I had probably 10 years as a nine years as a hospice volunteer, but the little fella, his little leg was burnt up. Oof. His left leg was burnt up. His little right, his little left arm was broken. And when I looked at him, because he couldn't have been dead long, because it wasn't rigor mortis, he couldn't have been dead long. And they said there was another one. And I had maybe three minutes of watching a guy standing next to him and showing him to who man is. And then we had to get out of there because they were coming to get the bodies. Okay. I don't know enough Spanish, but I understand enough Spanish to know when I see the terror on your face that it's time for us to go. Mm-hmm. You know, I'd been, I'd come out to Marine Corps by then. I'd worked for the DIA by then. You know, I'd done all those, that snooping and pooping. And I got to see my first alien. But that didn't that didn't mean anything to me, mm-hmm. you know, unless it needed hospice care or it needed palliative care. Uh, I, my mind did not lock in on that. Yeah. And so I said, David, I said that stuff is whether is there extraterrestrial life? Absolutely. Well, how do I know that? I've seen one of them little son of a bitches. <laughs> I heard the story, and who man is? Listen to this. He has a being in a glass case, Scott. This is the truth. That looks like those fake fairies that we saw in England in the turn of the century, 19th to the 20th century. You know, the 1890s, the Order of the Golden Dawn, to the 1920s, Blavatsky, all of that. Sacred Dawn, Art of the Golden Dawn, the Vikra, all that stuff that's going on there. They had those fake fairies that everybody bought into to somebody realized how the, you could computerize it and see it was fake. Well, he had the, the, but the, You talk about the Theosophical Society before Krishnamurti kind of blew it all open. You got it. Okay, yeah. and it's fake. Okay, so yeah. he had one of these in a glass case. And when he's in a glass case, okay, uh-huh. there's a little person, okay, the whole thing couldn't have been, it was less than two feet tall. I would say 14, 15 inches. Uh-huh. If that, if I'm gonna be slightly, I, mean, I would say, I'm gonna say 11 to 13 inches. Mm-hmm. And it had wings. And it looked like butterfly wings. Wow. He had skulls, elongated skulls with no center cranial line. Okay? Wow. Bigger eye sockets. Bigger eye sockets. He had like trunks of this stuff. Wow. Okay? So we went to NASA. We went everywhere. We went where there was a crash site all over Peru. And we went to, then he started telling me about uh, the Muche, that the Incas were nobody. Everybody in Peru thinks the Incas are just a big joke. Okay. And we go up to these cities. We go up to these cities in Northern Peru that you could, they're completely different from anything else. And you'd look at him and he said, this city's 18,000 years old. Wow. And they dug it up out of the desert. <laughs> it been, been covered in sand. Yeah. Unbelievable. And if you go, think about this. If you go to Titicaca, which is about 13.5, right? 13,500 right. feet. 
You go look at Google Satellite. Mm -hmm. It's a sea harbor. Now, how the fuck did that happen? And you can pick up shark's teeth. Well, of course, I've always been fascinated with the lines at Nazca that point straight to Machu Picchu. And, you know, clearly, you know, why would you have these big arrows pointing from up in the sky? And nobody's been able to figure out who created the lines at Nazca. Uh, yeah, I've only been to Peru twice, but I've always been fascinated with it. Yeah, but the Nazca people did it. Okay, but when you look at that, when you look at it, got you pulled back. Mm -hmm. Breath and you pull back when you look at it. How did you do it? Right, right. How did they do it? I mean, would it have to be through some form of laser? Well, we can survey. We today can survey because, and we can travel around the world because we do something called azimuth. We shoot azimuth, and you can survey a piece of property based on shooting an asthma. You can, you can use a, uh, you can use a sextant to sail across the Atlantic Ocean and know exactly where you're going by using the North Star and shooting an asthma to find out where in the ocean your ass is at. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Okay, so, and you can only do that at night. They on some fake lines that somebody created called longitude and latitude. Right. So the only way you could find out where you were going before we had electricity was in the middle of the night based on a lie. <laughs> and the sun comes, the sun rises in the east and it sets in the west. Okay, so when you look at these, when you're flying around, and you're, I could go to anything. I could go look at anything. Nobody was like, it was like in Egypt because I had, I had things. Zahi was one of my very best friends. You know, Zahi Halas, the director mm -hmm. of antiquities for Egypt. So I got to right. go see everything. So I'm telling David, I said, David, look. First you see, how is that possible to do? Okay, to make the Nazca lines? Very possible. Okay, if it's possible and it's there, then how did they do it? Okay, how did they do it? Okay, well, you can shoot azimuth. You know, we survey property without satellites or all that. Okay. So, yes, they could have done it. Okay. With knowing that it exists, knowing it was probable because all you do is scrape down three inches. You just scrape down three inches and because it never rains, the wind might blow every so often, and it's nothing. Hmm. Okay. It's nothing. So you know they carried water a long way to make those lines. You have to look at crews and capability. And when you look at it, once you get past that, it's possible for them to do it on the ground. Then why? That's the next thing you think. Why would they do it? Mm -hmm. well, there's only one reason. That somebody up there knew where they were. Mm -hmm. And then through the years, through the years, like there are some things that are just stupid. They're the symbol, and this is my personal view of it, Scott. If you look at their symbology based on what the lines are, the monkey, the condor, the basic things of, of, it, of, uh, of the mountain people, because of, of, of Quechua. No matter, Nazca is a language, but everybody speaks Quechua and most people speak Spanish. The Andes language is Quechua, which is basically 30% Japanese. Hmm, that's interesting. <laughs> By the way, Daniel, I think you might putting your hand or something over your microphone because you got a little muffled in the last few minutes and I want to hear everything you're saying. Uh -oh. Well, all I was talking about was the Nazca lines. Yeah, no, no, I know. But I just want to, whatever, I don't know if you, where your microphone is on. Are you using your computer microphone? Just that, whatever the computer mic is? I'm just holding my phone. You're just holding your phone. Oh, okay. So what's happening is, like, this little hole is where the microphone is. So what happens is when your hand goes over it a little bit, you become muffled. And I want to have the complete Danian experience. So just asking you to 
he said, be aware of that so I can hear this you This is a conversation between you and me. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Although what I would like is you were about 30 minutes ago, and I'd show it to you. There's about a two or three minute clip where you're talking about what you learned and you're talking about the practice of every day embodying what we believe God to be. I'd love to edit that into a little three minute clip and the audio was great. I'd love to edit that into a little three minute clip and show it to you first and see if we could um, show that as a wisdom clip. I don't care what you do. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll send it to you, but that's I the only... But I, if, if I already said it, listen, Scott, if I already said it and it's you, and it's you that I have to trust what I'm saying because I'm just talking. Yeah. You know, I'm just having a conversation between you and me. Yeah. If you see something that's good enough that, that serves this population, and that's one more thing that I've kept my word and another thing that I'm not on the, on the calendar for. You know, I got a little, I had, I knew I had one to two. I knew I had one to two today and I hadn't spent any time with you. And I said, okay, well then I'm going to stop. I'm going to carve it out and I'm going to spend it with Scott. Thank you, Daniel. Come on, man. You're a great human being, you know, and you can't fool me. I've been around. <laughs> You have, I'm, buddy. You have. I understand. I'm 70 years old. Wow. I've been I've been around, and I'm yeah. cool. You know, I watch. I I get. I, I have that nature about me, Scott. You know, I, if as long as you can talk and you put verbs in verbs in a sentence, <laughs> I'm gonna figure out it. I listen to the sound of a person person's voice, and then I listen to the tone in that voice because that's their mantra. Mm -hmm. That is their sacred sound. And then I just listen to verb conjugation because it tells me action and intent. If I get about a paragraph out of whoever you are, I'm going to know you. That's I'm going to understand you. That's an amazing quality. God, I, I mean, I try and do that as a coach. I try and listen to people's resonance, of course. And the more resonant they are, the more connected and centered they are, the more high pitched they get, they're off center. Okay. But, but what we, you just said is a whole new concept for me. This That's is a, yeah. Think about it. Listen, listen to me, Scott. I mean, I'm, I was letting you go, but watch, take a breath. You're not breathing. Breathe. When you catch it to a concept that's spiritual, that shifts your level, then what you do is you shut down your physical system. What you just did, you stop breathing because the way my phraseology changed the value of something that you were doing. You had a value of what you do about breathing and how it can be calm and how you can be peaceful and how you can stay in control and how you can own your life and how the resonance and the pitch in your voice changes. Okay. All that's really true. But who, what are you still talking about? The voice. Okay. Well, I view the voice as this. It is who you are. That person I'm looking at is the person you created today that as many people as you hope like you will like you because you are this person. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's not really you. You are your voice and everything mm -hmm. that your voice does and how you structure language based on verbs tells me 60% about you in two minutes. Wow. Which verbs do you like to listen to? Which verbs create trust for you? Trust has nothing to do with trust. Well, when I say trust, trust, well, yeah, okay. Actually, I do mean by trust, but go ahead. My trust is the system. I, that God everybody's trying to find, I can't find no place that little son of a bitch ain't. <laughs> <laughs> you know, everybody's looking for God, but well, that ain't my problem. <laughs> I'm trying to get away from that shit. <laughs> the, law, the law is immutable. It does not change. It's consistent. The universe is fair and just. And it's the nature. Our voice represents the divineness of us and the, the, the frequencies that we operate at and how we connect to create harmonies and how harmony, like calming people down. When you're talking about taking a voice to find calm, consistency and tranquility in a person's life okay 
Well, that's just controlling who they are mm. and teaching people to respect that this is the way outward nature perceives you and you're using it to give yourself the edge of protection, trust, and confidence in the voice you're either hearing or the voice you're trying to create to manifest. Scott, I can wear that shit out. I can take 2,000 son of a bitches and be just like this because they have to talk sooner or later. So when you said trust, the words that bring trust to me is that sun will come up, it'll go down and you can worry about it all night. <laughs> but it's going to happen. <laughs> okay. It's going to happen. And I trust in the greatness of humanity to be as crazy as great, powerful, and mighty to think I could pretend and truly realize that I could be the difference that God makes in the rules I made for God to love me. Mm. I trust in that because that's some funny shit. <laughs> You, you couldn't get me to fall for it again. I don't care what they're offered. Okay, so you get to hug people instead of inner, inner energetic reaction with them so you can feel what their voice is and you can feel what they're feeling as you're talking to them. And we get to separate from that. And we get to walk up to them and be distant from them like they're not here now. How can we fool ourselves into even believing what you're trying to tell us, God? And sooner or later, we're going to create virtual reality and artificial intelligence, and we're going to prove that you're right, <laughs> that you're capable of tricking us into believing something that cannot possibly be true. Right. <laughs> so she wins. <laughs> I, I trust that. I trust that, Scott. All the rest yeah. of it, all the rest of that's just science. Yeah. Just yeah. science. Okay, so now think of this. I've been to Peru. I've seen elongated skulls. I've seen fairy people. I've seen an alien. I've seen carvings of airplanes, glider planes, because looking at aerodynamics and all the stuff that this Dr. Jimenez Borda had. I see all of this, okay? And in the course of looking at it, I come to realize that everything we think that is real is not real. You know, and this is like, I had seen, uh, I had seen Peru in the 70s. And I saw Machu Picchu and I saw the, the beginnings of the revamp of the Inca Trail, like 72 or 73, when it was the uh, Machu Picchu was just grown over. It was only cut right in the, the squares, you know, and the road to it was one old raggedy bus when you left there because I walked there and I drove mm -hmm. from there. I don't have any choice. I had to get out of Chile. <laughs> you know, <laughs> when it's time to go, it's time to go. <laughs> well, that's a good place to go to. Machu Picchu that early on when it was still just before all the people that, you know, added their energy to it. I bet you really, I mean, I know when I've been to Machu Picchu and I've been there twice and I've been able to tip the guards and stay overnight and sleep in the ruins and really feel oh, yeah, it. yeah, come on. But that's all bullshit. All that was is some kind of priest class you're talking, when you look at the construction of it, mm -hmm. okay, look at these two things, Scott. I believe that the, not the Inca, but one of the conquered tribes who were builders in the Ulubamba Valley. When you look at Ulubamba and the sacredness of that valley, and you see those kind of constructions, and those people could build. There's only like two rocks that I can't understand about that you could build in the 13 or 1400s based on that you'd seen the Maya, that you'd seen the Maya in Guatemala and Honduras and uh, where Belize is and British Honduras and those kind of builders because the Incas built roads and they lasted mm. 150 years. And if they built this in the 1300s, it ain't nothing. 
the story and the legend was after 30 trips there was if you went up Wana Pichu and mm -hmm. you across the valley, you could see the what the golden city. Mm. You could see it. Okay, so when I would go there, I would always until my heart got so bad I couldn't do it. I would because I when you get around nine thousand, ten thousand feet, I get shortness of breath. Yeah, I can't. I can't flying. I can only do like two hours, and I can't do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm dying. Mm -hmm. Okay, but I don't. It ain't like a big deal. Mm -hmm. You know, as long as as long as they got the baby food aisle, I'm in business. <laughs> <laughs> I got the door open. <laughs> got that I got a big jar of electrolytes for babies. You know, it's for baby hydration. And I buy them and if, if I'm staying, if I'm going, if I'm staying somewhere, I'm doing I always carry it with me. <clears throat> or if I go to a city and I have a couple of days there, so if I have to fly in, I go get it. And I'm drinking that shit all the time. I love it. Baby food electrolytes. That's going right in with the trace minerals and the B complex. In the morning, you get you a, get you a good shot. Take your trace minerals, wash it down with apple juice, and you're Superman. You got it. You know, all of a sudden, everything that your body intakes, it has the tools. B complex because of three, six, and twelve time release. But everything that the body's going to need to properly function with whatever it's going to deal with. It has sufficient trace minerals. It has sufficient B in the complex, which controls operating DNA. And you put as much pH as you can mm -hmm. and you watch the, all those little food stuffs, everything that you do. But the action is giving the body all the tools it needs to get the job done. Mm -hmm. You know, and think of this, Scott. If you had a Granny Smith green apple and the tree that you bought, and it'd be 28 years ago now, and you ate that apple 28 years ago, to go get an apple off the same tree today and eat it based on chemical fertilizer, mm -hmm. you would have to eat 24 and a third apples to get the same amount of Enzymes. Wow. Thank you. The food has no nutritional value. It has none. Organic, maybe 10 or 15%. So supplementation is a requirement based on pharmaceutical methodologies in our world as this crap we eat today. Cheese whiz is plastic. It's plastic. It has no nutritional value. One of my favorite drunk junk foods as a kid was zebra cakes. It's called a zebra cake. It was just one of those can one of those little cakes like Twinkies and all of that. Right. Hostess ho ho's, that kind of yeah. shit. All right. So I saw I saw a zebra cake in a grocery in a quick shop or someplace to stop to get gas. And I turned it over to look at what was in it. <laughs> there was no food in it at all. Nothing. The only thing you got from it was carbs and sugar. Mm -hmm. That's the only two ingredients it had that was not synthetically made. And the sugar was high fructose corn syrup. Right. Now, that's insanity. Yeah. And that's what we put into most people's bodies. One of the most tragic moments in my life of witnessing was um, I used to go visit Grandfather David. Uh, you might have met him. He came a couple times to the early expo shows. And he lived in Hope Villa, Arizona, Hopi Land. And I was there visiting him one time when I saw, you know, all those people where they live, they can't grow anything. It's just rock. And so they are completely reliant on the government to provide them with food, but the government doesn't give them money or the government brings them food. And it's all hostess, ho-ho, white bread, corn syrup, white refined sugar shit. And I was there when I saw what they were being delivered 
and then they put it on a pile and the men danced around it like you know they used to do all of it. but instead of dancing around buffalo meat they're dancing around the crap that the government's giving them and these men had the most their bodies were gray from just such lack of nutrition and what they were dancing around was all what you're describing total synthetic non-food processed shit and i realized oh my god my government is still killing the indians this is a genocide this is a slow deliberate genocide and it broke my fucking heart no i get it because watch if you want to really mess something up really mess it up bring some white people there and leave them about six months yeah <laughs> Yeah, and listen, we're a couple of old white guys. You know, it's funny. One of the big things I'm working on with this show is, look, we've got to get young people. we got to okay, get... Okay, so, all right, stop, stop. All right, stop, okay? Compose the show. Let's, get, let's quit talking. All right. Compose, compose the show for me. Okay, so we're going to bring you on um, and kind of honor you. That's why I might put together a little video clip. Um, do you prefer... The way the show works is everybody gets um, two to five minutes to kind of present whatever they want to present. Um, now, if you want, I can edit a clip from what we did today, or we could just have you on. Of course, we're going to use Zoom like this, but it's Zoom. So it's, going to be you, it's going to be you asking me questions? It can be. It can be me asking you questions. Um, and, you know, definitely what we really want to do is just honor you. You know, we want you to kind of be... Next week, next Saturday, we've got Carolyn Mace, Carolyn Casey, Danny Sheehan, and some really wonderful musicians um, are going to be our guests. And you're kind of our featured person that we want to, you know, put some attention on. So, and then right, we also that's have... This, that's this Saturday. This Saturday, April 25. Okay. Yeah. So, the show, the, the show goes from 7.30 until 9.30. I'll create the agenda tomorrow because we've just locked in all of our talent. In fact, you're the last person I'm talking to. Um, so now we've locked in all of our musicians. We've locked in our talent. I'll create the agenda. We'll probably have you about halfway through. So figure around 8.30 is when we'll have you on. It's Zoom webinar. So it's like this, but instead of just being you and me, there's going to be about 15 people in panels, you know, little, little boxes. Um, our musicians, our other speakers. Um, and then we'll have about 500 people in the webinar room watching live. And we'll have about another eight or 10,000 people watching on Facebook. Um, those are the numbers that, you know, we've been kind of getting and that it, it's growing every week. Um, okay, and, so I, hold on. All right, so hold on, let me close this door. Sure. So, <laughs> So what we're doing based on, based on uh, where society is today is creating a network or a series, because Zoom is business, mm -hmm. a series of programming for, for you being at home on Saturday night. Right. And basically this is a, it's a new age variety show. Music, we even have, we have a magician. We've got Jeff McDaniels, he's from your town, from Las Vegas, um, who's a great magician. We've got three different musical okay, acts. Okay, so let me ask you something. Yeah. Let's say that I could ask uh, Terry Fader. Think of this, God. I mean, I'm gonna do whatever you wanna do, okay? And I appreciate being honored, but you know I don't go into all that stuff. I don't think about that stuff too much. Yeah, but other people enjoy that shit. They like to live vicariously through you. Well, but I'm 100% in support. As you're producing it. I was enjoying spending time with you, but I see it's 2 o'clock, and yeah. I, I got, I'm, I'm anal retentive and obsessive compulsive. And when I know what the show is, then if I have to have a comedian or something, then I could go to Terry Fader, and I could get Terry to, to tape something uh, – that could be inserted and I could get him to put it up on his, his people, send it out to his people. Okay. That's probably 2 million. Wow. Wow. Well, that would be very cool. 
Yeah, it's how you, you know, he's got nothing to do. He's just sitting at home. He's going crazy. Wow. Could we schedule some time in the next day or two for you and I and he to have a chat to kind of figure that out? Yeah, I'm just trying to, with everything else I have to do, because I have to go back to, I have to go back to Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. Because I'm helping produce uh, David Wilcox's his show. Is this Saturday good for you, or would it be better to move it to another Saturday? Well, I'm listening. That's why I said frame the show, give me the time. Because he's doing... Uh, on his list I so, don't I think his arrogance would not let him do anything mm -hmm. uh, but how can I get him to send it out on his list which would be Richard which I'd have to have all that done and babysit through it based on producing his show so let me ask you this because um, we're doing this every Saturday night we had thought of doing it with you this upcoming Saturday night because our partner is the New Living Expo and Kenny Kaufman. But we're going to be doing it with the Lucidity Festival, which is kind of young kids on May 2nd. Then we're doing it with the Conscious Life Expo on May 9th. Then we're doing it with Heart Math on May 16th. So if you want a couple more weeks, we could probably a good one to do it would be May 9th when we're partnering with the Conscious Life Expo. Um, Okay, uh, let's go. And that, that'd be the one that we'd honor me on. Yeah. And then, so and and that gives more time and that way you're not double, you know, double booked. Well, I, that's because I see Scott, I can just tell you, mm -hmm. I don't, I don't have to be, look, we've been friends way too long for me to be anything but real with each other. And nobody can't not be real with me. If you think you're going to pull something over on me, you funny. Uh, yeah, come on and get you some. I've been waiting on your ass. <laughs> you <know? laughs> You're the person I spent my whole life waiting for you to get here, big boy. <laughs> so, well, you know so what they say: I, we are the ones we've been waiting for. Yeah, we are got, the ones we've been waiting for. Okay, so May ninth. That okay, means I'll, May 9th. I'll be finished. Well, because David's paying me. Yeah. You know, I said, David, look, this is shit's all crazy. I said, this is crazy. I said, you're a magnificent preventer, presenter, and you have a skill set. And I said, your subject matter is cohesive. I don't understand a lot of it, but I'm not supposed to understand it. What I know how to do is make a tight show. I know how to squeeze it and make it tight. Look like what you're doing right now. Yeah. You know, you squeeze it, you produce it, you make it as tight because you know something's going to go crazy. You got to get exactly who you can depend on and you got to sweat for two fucking hours. <laughs> okay, well, you know, though, honestly, for the most part, even when all, you know, because I'm kind of doing all the where the, I put where the spotlights on and who's coming on when and all that. I'm having a ball. I'm having a blast because you know what? I let everybody pe know at the beginning that something's going to change. But as our friend Fantucci says, blessed are the flexible for they shall never break. So I just stay in that mode, you know, and we have fun, you know, and it really is a fun show. And you know what? For the most part, we haven't had any big fuck ups. It's been pretty smooth every week. And, and, and what do people do in their two minute clips? Everything you can imagine. Um, the two minutes I usually bring in, like I've got a gal who's gonna be doing pole dancing. Um, her two minutes, just talking about, you know, okay, here I am stuck, I can't go out, I can't go dancing. So it's me and my pole. And as she's doing her pole dancing, she's gonna share a poem. Uh, another woman is going to do and a everybody, fire. Okay, hold on. Everybody stays on the whole two hours? You don't have to. It's nice if you do. I'd say probably three quarters of our people stay on the whole time. But like, you know, some of our big speakers or some of the people that are really, you know, just super tight busy. Like Jai Utah. We had Jai Utah last week. He came on. He did 10 minutes, led people on a sound journey, and then he left. So you don't have to be there the whole two hours. Um, yeah, but if it's in honor of me, because we're thinking about this Saturday as opposed to May 9th. Right. If it's in honor of me, how could I not be? Well, yeah, it would be, it would, it'd be a little weird. But we could, I, you know, we could pull it off. We can say, hey, coming in live, we got him. We just are so grateful to have only five minutes with Daniel Brinkley. You know, look, we can make anything work, right? We can okay, make well, anything happen. If we build it around Kenny, because here's what, Scott, Kenny's going to think he's the one that got me. 
Right. Okay. He's going to think he, there's nothing wrong with Kenny. I just understand everything about him. And I love him. Yeah. Okay. Ken's like, easy. Yeah. I mean, no, Kenny's not easy. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's being facetious. Although, you know, I got to say, honestly, he is more chill than I've ever seen him. Like, he was totally chill about having to cancel the expo. Um, as we've been kind of partnering with him, there's some things that he wanted to do. And I said, Ken, I don't think that's a great idea. He's been, okay, let's change it. Like every suggestion I've made, he's gone along with. Um, it's the easiest I've ever seen Ken be. It's like something, you know, we're all changing. We're all transforming. Remember this, Scott. Remember this. And this is my little arrogance. I told him. I told him and I told Quicksilver. I said, listen, guys, everything's going streaming. Yep. It does not matter. And the world will be Saturday and Sunday afternoon. It does not matter. Monday night to get you over what you just went through and Saturday and Sunday. Yeah. And programming based on being alone, based on what, how, you, how you deal with it, what you think about it. Is it natural and normal? Are you living in a regular world? Or are you fucking going crazy? Mm. Okay, you design the programming, okay? Now, if it's about Kenny, and you and I were plotting for the most advantage in that, then that Kenny got me to come do this because he put himself into it. But I already told him this would happen. I said, streaming, I said, the big networks are gone. It's streaming. What this can turn into if seen and packaged clips from it with everybody giving you permission is a sizzle reel mm -hmm. that can go to a programming that I could take it to Disney. I don't think Disney, but I could go to Netflix. Okay, and then there's Amazon Fire. I mean, there's so many places right now, Scott, that people will buy this. As you know, it's like going after the younger market, but there's 74 million old people and they buy shit. Mm. Okay. And we not, we're not selling anything but wisdom right. <clears throat> and some, and some trace men. <laughs> people always that used to ask me when I, uh, I'd say, look, they said, well, why don't you package and sell them? I said, I don't want to be bothered with it. And I said, when you, when you sell your own product, <clears throat> you can't be as honest and as sure about it unless you are. And I don't know anybody I'm as honest and sure about it except me when I say it. Okay. And so when I, I sell other people's stuff, but I don't get paid for that because I'm not a doctor or any of that. I just know how I, as Danny and Brinkley at 70 years old, can get the fuck up from the dead. And I have done it four times, no matter what you think, with no chance to ever have survived. Jump on that, big boy. <laughs> You're not my type, but I love you, Daniel. Yeah, but I, I, I don't think I'll jump on it, but I sure do appreciate it. Listen, that's just me, though, Scott. See, people never see, this is you and me. This is who I am. You know that. Yeah. A person that the whole world doesn't see, they see part of that character. Yeah. But yeah. see, that's, what, that's one of the things I love about you, because that's the whole point. We're everything. We can be saint and sinner. It's all inside of us, right? It's no, all I'm, inside of us. I'm the sinner. <laughs> I have no problems with which of the two I am. <laughs> <laughs> You're both, partner. You're both. Yeah. You're both. Yeah. No, no, to deny any part of yourself is to deny God itself. And no, but, we don't no, want to do no. that. You get another lightning bolt for that one. But Scott, what if you what if you calculate it? What if you uh think about the only things that really excite me are things that happened that I did not structure. Hmm. I did not set it up. Mm -hmm. I did not as one person weave the Twilight Brigade into the most powerful healthcare system and the largest healthcare system in the United States called the Veterans Administration. Mm. And I had a memorandum of understanding with the fucking federal government to call alternative and integrative therapeutic modalities and took and created compassionate caring people as an alternative integrative therapy, which was my goal 
So mm -hmm. the eyes Damien Brinkley created an alternative and integrative therapy in the Veterans Administration in palliative and end of life care by caring about people having somebody to talk to that's in honor of them serving this country. Mm -hmm. Now, do you think that's easy? Mm -hmm. And that I stayed there 37 years. Paid your dues, boy. Paid your dues. Hey, do me a favor. My computer's about to die. I just grab my computer uh, charger. Thank you for that. So do you want to do this Saturday or is it better to make it May 9th? Don't you think that uh, May 9th would be better? That's because my instinct. I think May 9th is a better choice. It gives us more time. And that way you're not, you're not stressing. You can really give David your full attention. Are you paying me? Yeah, well, absolutely. So let's, let's do May 9th. Let's do May 9th. Yeah, okay, because then I can talk to... I can talk to uh, Terry Fader. Terry, I mean, he'll do it. I know he'll do it. And how do I drive traffic and how do I set up my Facebook? I can help you with all that stuff. Um, because if it's about me, uh, it's about me or Kenny and it's about the New Living Expo, which is what I was getting ready to tell you that how do we get the most out of it? And if it's about Kenny, which is the new living expo and I'm the person that Kenny decided to feature, that's only going to make when we can get back together again, it's only going to empower. If he can do it in October, we're empowering him to, we're doing a show that promotes what Kenny's doing and who Kenny is, you know, and he has a forum for people to come together. You know, we get him on there too. As people yeah. that come together to make a difference, we get him on there too, and then we make it a, a new living expo. Good, good, good. Um, I know you had said two o'clock, and honestly, I was supposed to call somebody at two, but there's no way I'm going to get off the phone with Daniel Brinkley while I'm still talking to you. But I do we, need to. We have it covered. We have now the ninth. We have the ninth. Yeah, we all do. right, Daniel. Thank you so much for your time, and thank you for all the wisdom. I mean, honestly. I'm only six years younger than you, but I, I learn so much from you every time I'm with you. And I really appreciate that. Thank you. Thank well, you for the generosity. And, and, I, and I love you. Hmm. I look in life at people that I care about and that I have known and that I know. And my, I may have a warped sense of value perception, but I know people that I appreciate and who I love. And when I was on the tractor, I was thinking about what was that little girl's name? He was like a playboy bunny or something. Pamela Bryant? No. Lumina? I don't know. I don't know. I swear to God. In my life, you will always have a spot. <laughs> you know? I know. In my life, in my life in that week, you know, you went down, and I was saying it when I was on the tractor. Scott, you got no problems out of me, son. Whatever <laughs> you need me to do, don't be honoring me and shit because I'm dying. Okay? I don't know <laughs> more because that's what I thought it was from listening to Kenny. Oh, no, I, no, no. I ain't listening to none of that. No. Okay? So I said, and I said, I couldn't remember her name then, but I said, Scott, you don't have no problems with me when you was into the tantra business. Yeah with me. You need yep. me to be on the show and you need me to do something. You tell me exactly what you want me to do. Like I wrote to Kenny, where, when, subject line, question mark, where, when, subject line. I'll, I'm busy, but I'll do my part. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm. Because if it's you, okay, that's it. I appreciate that so much, Tanya. Thank you. Well, having your next panoramic life review 
and your inside Scott Katamas, you're going to feel how much I love and appreciate you. And how much you, you, you simultaneously crack me up and also awaken greater wisdom and greater awareness. So I crack you me. up and wake you up at the same time. You crack me up, you crack me open and awaken me up at the same time. And isn't that the way a that all the great wisdom? A conversation with Daniel Brinkley. He cracks me up and wakes me up all at the same time. I'm going to go write that down. You write that right, down. It's fine. true. You got right, it. Let's, let's do this. Let's do this next Monday. Uh, okay. Talk on Monday. Yeah. Let me see. We just take a couple of minutes. Let me see yeah. where I am. Let me see where I am. So he would do five minutes. Yeah. Uh, Terry would do five minutes. Okay, and he has to have time. He has to have time to get it up and out and on his Facebook, which is not very big, but he has a mailing list. Okay, I'll ask him. Cool. And uh, do you want to set a time now for us to talk on Monday? Is, is it best to set a specific time? Yeah, let's say 1 o'clock because I'll probably be in the car driving back to Las Vegas from L.A. Okay, great. I know no, they'll I drive well. Don't you go on. But you uh, know, I, I can, it's like automatic, though, Scott. You know, I just go into the trance. <laughs> well, that's a good time to be driving from L.A. to Vegas as opposed to driving Sunday night from Vegas to L.A. That won't happen. Yeah, yeah you're smarter than that. All right, Monday, April 27th at 1 o'clock. I look forward to seeing you then, my friend, or talking to you kisses. then. Hugs and kisses. All right, God's blessings. Take care. Love you, bye.